morning, and welcome to Sunday morning at the Niebel Proctor Marxist Library, which is a pro project of the Institute for the Critical Study of Society. Our mission at ICSS is the dissemination and deepening of the theories of Karl Marx and, and the movements to which he gave rise. We're convinced that this uh, activity is an absolutely necessary condition for resolving the pressing crisis of our time and ushering in a newer, higher form of social organization, communism. This is one of our weekly sessions on current issues and Marxist theories. I will be your moderator today. We have been holding these sessions for 15 years at the Niebel Proctor Library in Oakland, California. We are happy now to be able to make them available to a worldwide audience through live streaming and on demand on the YouTube platform. Today, we welcome Jeff Mackler. Jeff is a leader of the US-based organization, Socialist Action. He served as its national secretary and was its presidential candidate in 2016 and 2020. He was a coordinator of the 1998 Dialogue with Cuba conference at UC Berkeley, in which 2,000 people, including a 30-person Cuban delegation, participated in what was the first institutional conference of its type. Jeff has visited Cuba at the invitation of the Cuban government and is the author of several books and camp pamphlets on Cuba. In addition, he is the director of the mobilization to free Mumia Abu Jamal, a, co a, a coordinator and founder of the Bay Area End the Wars Coalition, an administrative committee member of the United National Anti-War Coalition, and on the steering committee of AssangeDefense.org. Uh, he will speak on why the Cuban revolution has endured, a Marxist assessment of Cuba's historic break with capitalist rule and its lessons today. Um, after his talk, there will be plenty of time for questions and discussions. We're privileged to welcome Jeff Mackler. Please go ahead, Jeff. Jeff, you need to unmute. Well, I am honored to be with you today. And as I peruse the faces uh, on this Zoom call, I see that I'm accompanied by a number of older people, older comrades. So I want to start with some older memories that I had. <clears throat> it began when I was 16 years old, which was 1956, and I was a camp counselor at Surprise Lake Camp in uh, upstate New York. And the uh, camp leadership decided they were going to do a play. And the play was called Guys and Dolls. Am I making any connections with my audience? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> Guys and Dolls was uh, starring uh, Frank Sinatra and Marlon Brando. They were heading up a group of gamblers. And the problem was that they had no place to assemble their troop of gamblers to do their illegal work. So they cut a deal with the local head <clears throat> of the Salvation Army, a beautiful woman. And she said, well, if you reform this troop of gamblers, um, then you can uh, uh, and bring them to the Salvation Army Church for um, to hear the word of God, then I will um, do something for you. And Marlon Brando and Frank Sinatra said, well, would you come to Cuba with me? That point struck in my mind because at the time Cuba was seen as the whorehouse 
of the rich who visited Miami and took a, a quick plane flight to Cuba for prostitutes and gambling. The Cuban society was led by a US-backed dictator, Fragencia Batista, and the gambling casinos were presided over by the Jewish mafia <clears throat> headed by Meyer Lansky. In 1959, a few uh, 1960, I was watching television with my dad. We were watching the Sunday evening uh, broadcast called The Ed Sullivan Show. Ed Sullivan was famous for having super um, talented people. He had Elvis Presley and he had the Beatles. And to my amazement, he walked to the audience. He's a right wing uh, commentator. He had one of the most popular shows in the country uh, for the Daily News newspaper. And he said, Ladies and gentlemen of America, I'd like to introduce you to Fidel Castro, the George Washington of America, where, or the George Washington of Cuba. And Fidel, in his military fatigues, strolls onto the stage in front of my dad and me and the family and doesn't say a word other than wave and then disappears. That was his appearance as the George Washington of Cuba. It's another way of saying that in the early days of the Cuban revolution, US imperialism didn't know what to expect. Herbert Matthews, a key reporter for the New York Times visited Fidel in the Sierras and was impressed that he was simply another progressive Democrat at the time. Fidel pledged that he would overthrow the Batista government, which had abrogated the 1940 constitution, and he would restore that constitution in Cuban society. Fidel was a, um, a son of a relatively large landowner. He was an attorney, and he was a member of one of the two um, classic bourgeois parties in Cuba the conservatives and the Orthodox party. He was a member of the Orthodox party. He organized the failed attempt to take power in 1953, when he and a small band attacked the Moncada barracks. He was imprisoned by the Batista regime, but in an indication that they wanted to avoid civil strife, they let him go. He went to Mexico where he met with a young Argentine asthmatic and they signed on Che Guevara, not as a fighter or a commander, but as basically part of the medical team. They boarded the grandma ship and landed in Cuba with some hundred people. And most of them were killed because the Batista military had advanced notice that they were coming and they moved into the Sierras where they began a three year, basically guerrilla battle to befriending the peasants in the country, educating them as they went and confronting the Batista army. At the time, everyone thought that Fidel was a Democrat, which he was with a small d. That is he wanted a democratic constitution. He promised reforms for the poor peasantry. When Fidel marched into Havana, victorious on New Year's Day, 1959, he announced that Manuel Uritia and Juan Cardona would be the prime minister and the, the president and the prime minister of the country. They were two anti-Batista bourgeois figures. And that was it. He had accomplished his mission and he expected this new initial government to preside over some modest reforms, the most important of which was the land reform. And at that point, within a couple of months, the Uritia government connected to the anti-Batista bourgeoisie 
refused to take any moves to grant the peasants in that country the land. Fidel intervened, removed these two figures, assumed the presidency, along with his July 26th movement. July 26th was the date of the attack on the Moncada barracks. July 26th movement uh, was one of three major uh, or three currents that organized against Batista. One of them was the, the most important was the July 26th, the guerrilla based movement. There was a directorate, which was basically a student, a youth organization that was anti Batista. And then there were small members of the Cuban Communist Party called the Socialist Party of Cuba. They were a Stalinist party that had participated in the Batista government decades earlier, especially when Batista allowed them to lead the major trade union federation in the country. I visited Cuba during the special period, and I met with an interesting fellow at the suggestion of the Cuban government. He was the head of Cuba's space program, and he worked in close collaboration with the Russians with the idea that the Cubans could partner in send, sending someone in space. But he was an old time member of the Cuban Communist Party, and he knew <coughs> that I was from a Trotskyist party. I initially uh, joined Socialist Workers Party when I was a youngster in the late in the late 50s. And the party that I currently head, I'm the national secretary today of Socialist Action, is in the tradition of the World Trotskyist Movement. He was interested in that question. And he said to me, Jeff, in the, in the early days of the revolution, we all thought Fidel was a Trotskyite. We thought he was an ultra left. We thought that he was going to uh, fail. In fact, he had this view that Cuba, a backward country, could proceed quickly to socialism. And that is, as opposed to supporting a bourgeois democracy, which would institute modest reforms. He said Fidel was right on Cuba, but he was wrong everywhere else on earth. And what he was referring to at the time was the fact that the Cubans organized guerrilla warfare struggles in virtually every country in Latin America with the exception of <clears throat> um, Mexico and Paraguay, where they sent guerrilla groups to repeat the experience of the Cubans. It was called continental-wide guerrilla warfare. The idea was simple. You get together a small group of people, send them up into the mountains, make friends with the peasants, uh, march on the cities and uh, take power. <coughs> but the world imperialist system was not going to allow any such revolution to repeat the course of the Cubans. Over the course of 10 years, every single one of the guerrilla outfits that the Cubans sent into the countryside was defeated. Not to mention that Che himself was sent to the Congo to hook up with the remnants of the um, Lumumba group that the United States orchestrated a coup to remove. And he had to be physically removed <coughs> and sent back to Cuba, whereupon soon after <coughs> he became part of a guerrilla group in Bolivia. We had a major debate in my party at the time <clears throat> on the question of guerrilla warfare. We didn't think that the Cuban example could be easily repeated anywhere. Our conception was that the socialist revolution, the Marxist conception, had to be based on building a mass working class party in the urban centers of every country, as opposed to relatively isolated guerrillas stuck up in the mountains to rift the supplies <clears throat> and contact with the mass working class movement. So we had an awful lot of debates with the Cubans. 
but we were impressed with the early measures of the Cuban revolution. So I want to review them. <clears throat> First was that the Cubans captured a good deal of the murderous, raping, genocidal Batista army. They held mass assemblies in sports stadiums and the people presented the evidence of these, um, of the atrocities committed by the Batista regime. This was early on in 1959-60. They had mass trials and the people voted what to do. And when they had the evidence presented by hundreds, if not thousands of people, they voted to execute these people. Their slogan was al paradon para las teístas, to the wall with the terrorists, and they shot them. The United States government intervened. They maintained an ambassador in Cuba, and they believed that Fidel was just another liberal Democrat who they could deal with. He wasn't going to challenge capitalist property, and he definitely wasn't going to um, give the land to the peasants. Much of the land was owned by U.S. corporations like the United Fruit Corporation. So they said to Fidel, you can't do these executions of these murderers. You have to have dem democratic rights. You have to give them a fair trial. But these were mass assemblies of working people, and they were armed. And Fidel basically said, the only way we can stop these mass trials is to bring in the troops. And the last thing we're going to do is call on the Cuban army, which was a guerrilla army, to intervene in the affairs of masses of people who were seeking vengeance against the US-backed Batista murderers. The United States got very nervous about that point. And they decided to pressure the Cuban regime by limiting or cutting off the sugar quota. And further, they decided that the oil that Cuba used to run its factories couldn't be processed through the US, um, through the through the US owned oil refineries in Cuba. Fidel's response was to nationalize the oil refineries, process the oil, and get on with business. But what shocked the imperialists most of all is that within six or eight months, they established an institute on agrarian reform, INRA, that, wrote, that basically drew up the first plan for massive land distribution in the country. <clears throat> they not only gave the land to the peasants in the largest land reform in the history of the world, with the exception of the 1917 Russian Revolution, <clears throat> but they combined the distribution of land to the peasants with a massive, unprecedented literacy campaign. That is, they basically, on a voluntary basis, closed the schools in Cuba and asked the young high school and college kids to go into the countryside. They gave them a kerosene lantern because the countryside was not electrified. And they worked along with the peasants, who for the first time in their lives, not only had the land, but they had a young person working with them to till the land on the one hand, and in the evenings to teach them to read. In the shortest time in, uh, on record, Cuba's literacy campaign, combined with the granting of the land to the peasants, reduced literacy to the lowest level in all of Latin America. Cuba has the highest literacy rate in the, in, the, uh, in the world today, not to mention its educational system, where it has the highest number of doctors per capita, the largest percentage of its population with PhDs, an incredible development of the cultural center and all of the social services that came. The United States decided that this government had to go and they, organized in 1961 a invasion of Cuba. It was at the Bay of Pigs, Playa Giron. Their idea was that they would send a well-armed force of several thousand people with air cover 
they would basically establish a base uh, on the island, move inland, and declare this was free territory, in which case they would immediately ask the United States for formal recognition, and uh, if not troops, and they would throw out the Fidelista leadership. The Cubans were aware of this, and they sent the entire armed forces of the country, not to mention students, they interrupted the literacy campaign, and they sent the Cuban people, led by Fidel, who, who jumped aboard a tank and participated in the fighting, to the Playa Heron, and in a matter of three days, defeated the army and captured the US-backed army. The United States denied that they had anything to do with this. They said that the operation was organized out of the Dominican Republic. The CIA was not involved. The United States knew nothing about it. But of course, the captured soldiers told otherwise, and the embarrassed UN, uh, US ambassador to the United Nations dec declaring that the United States knew nothing about it was made a public liar around the world, Adlai Stevenson. What did the Cubans do with the captured soldiers? They negotiated a deal with the United States to return almost all of them. And they re in return for which, the United States pledged and gave Cubans enough medical supplies to inoculate the entire country against the major diseases that people were inoculated for in the United States, measles, cholera, <clears throat> and all of the other diseases that previously took the lives of thousands of people. The Cubans were inoculated with American medical supplies. Most of these soldiers were returned, except a few. And that is the worst of the Batista butchers that returned were imprisoned and some were executed. At that point, the, United, the, the Cubans understood that the United States was not going to give Cuba time to do anything. You have to forgive me, I have a new bird in the back of my house, a little cockatiel, who insists that he join this meeting. So what happened next was amazing. The Cubans, fearing another invasion, asked the Soviet Union to bring missiles to Cuba to defend them against attack. And the Russians installed the first installations whereupon the United States in 1962 sent a fleet and informed the Soviet Union and the world that if the Cubans attacked the United States, they would consider it an attack on uh, uh, coming from the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and they pledged to use nuclear weapons. I was in Columbus, Ohio at the time, a young student at Antioch College, and we organized a protest. We seriously, believed that we were facing a situation of absolute and total nuclear war. So uh, the demonstrations were across the country and in the United States. A deal was cut and the Cubans withdrew the missiles and the United States in a side deal agreed to remove US missiles in Turkey that were aimed at the Soviet Union. At that point, the Cubans made a critical decision. They said that they were going to nationalize the capitalist class down to the nails in the heels of their boots. And they proceeded to nationalize something like 98% of the Cuban economy to the amazement of the United States. Well, in the course of these first few years, the United States began an embargo, a blockade, an invasion, and terrorist activities sending guerrillas up to the Sierras thinking that they could repeat what the Fidelistas had done. Cuba has suffered for 60 years. And would you mind, Rich, if I took a 30 second break to let this poor bird out so he stops squawking? Go right ahead. I'll take two seconds. 
Thanks so much. I apologize. It's a family bird that we've adopted. So the Cubans nationalized capitalist property down to the nails in the boots of their shoes. And that shocked the world. It interested us in the Socialist Workers Party at the time. We had comrades in Miami who had access to Piper Cubs and we visited Cuba. We helped establish the first Fair Play for Cuba Committee, along with some of the most prominent people in the country. We held demonstrations across the country up until the time that the president of the United States was assassinated, John F. Kennedy. <clears throat> Everyone wondered who was responsible for the assassination. And lo and behold, the person who was, who was responsible, Lee Harvey Oswald, was photographed with a picture of the newspaper for my party, The Militant, and another photograph with the People's World newspaper. The implication was that our party, if not the Communist Party, participated in the assassination of the President of the United States. We were just emerging from the witch hunt in the United States, and it sent a chill down our spines, to say the least. We issued a statement saying we had nothing to do with it. As it turned out, Lee Harvey Oswald photos were uh, manufactured, uh, that is, him holding our newspaper. But the record showed that he had joined the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. He was a right winger and had nothing to do with our party, but perhaps as a government agent, he joined the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. In any case, I want to review <clears throat> some of the main features of the Cuban Revolution. When I visited Cuba the first time, I met with the head of the Cuban cadre school, who was responsible in collaboration with Che Guevara of sending Cuban armed groups to virtually every country in Latin America to repeat the experience. And at that point, I explained that we differed with that. And in time, the Cubans recognized that they could not repeat that experience, that it was a mistake. But it was 10 years and the entire left debated it. We all thought, well, let's just go into the mountains and make a revolution. Our Venezuelan comrade at the time, uh, Peter Camayo, who was our presidential candidate, told us in 1962 that there was a guerrilla operation in Venezuela and they were going to take power in a short period of time. All of these ventures failed, but we talked about other revolutions and including Nicaragua, which had its revolution in 1979. And at the time of the Nicaraguan revolution, where the Sandinistas defeated the US-backed Somoza government, Nicaraguans had to make similar choices to the Cubans. And Fidel basically advised them, don't do what we did in Cuba. Don't take the Cuban road. Each revolution has its unique features and you can't repeat it. Fidel's proposition was based on the idea that the Nicaraguans could not expect support from the Soviet Union, military or commodities or whatever. And therefore they couldn't be as bold. We publicly criticized Fidel saying in our view, the Cuban road was the only road and that is the mobilization of the working people in that country and arming that population to challenge capitalist power, nationalize bourgeois property, distribute the land <clears throat> and use that as an example in the same way that the Cubans were an example to revolutionaries around the world. When I visited Nicaragua when I asked the leadership about the Nicaraguan revolution. Their response was, yes, we did say that early on, but that was a mistake that Nicaragua made only half a revolution, whereas the Cubans made a whole revolution. What did the Cuban leadership mean by a half a revolution? And that is, they, they understood that the Sandinistas, which had support from the Cubans, Che worked early on with the guerrilla struggle 
and the, and of the Sandinistas. Uh, I was in contact with them. But the Nicaraguans, yes, defeated the US-backed Somoza dictatorship, which had killed 60,000 people, but they declined to distribute the land. That was a fundamental mistake in our view that allowed the US and the opponents to undermine the revolution, saying that promises notwithstanding, the peasants in that country still don't have the land. And indeed in 1991, when the Nicaraguans conducted their second election for the presidency, to their own shock, the Nicaraguan uh, Daniel Ortega president was defeated in election. And the opposition, the bourgeois opposition, uh, led by Violeta Chamorro, her husband was the anti Somoza uh, editor of La Prensa, the leading publication in the country. The Sandinistas lost the election. To this day, leaving aside the exigencies of the Nicaraguan Revolution, the Nicaraguans haven't distributed the land to the people. They haven't instituted the kind of health and medical programs and educational programs because they're incapable of doing that. They basically have an electoral alliance in Nicaragua with forces ranging from the Catholic Church to the Council on Private Enterprise, which still exist as powerful forces in that country. So the Cubans set the example, but the Nicaraguans didn't follow through. In 1979, there was another revolution in Latin America in the Caribbean. It was Grenada. And I organized in the United States the Grenada Solidarity Committee. <clears throat> and I visited Grenada and met with the leadership of that revolution, whose name was Maurice Bishop. Bishop was a popular lawyer in the country. And he um, was part of a exiled Grenadian community in Brooklyn, New York. Grenada was among the poorest islands in the Caribbean, a tiny place, roughly 20 by 10 miles, basically a mountain uh, of volcanic origins with a road around it. And he used to speak for his bishop at our forums uh, in New York City, promising that he would return to Grenada and make a revolution. Well, he did just that. And he got the support of the Cubans. And a debate broke out in the Grenadian revolutionary current, as, which was called the New Jewel Movement. Jewel stood for Joint Endeavor for Welfare, Education, and Liberation. The question was, should we follow the Cuban road? And they had some big divisions in that country, so much so that the New Jewel Movement became divided, Bishop became a minority, and Bernard Cord was the majority of the Central Committee of the Grenadian New Jewel Movement. A giant battle as to the course of the Grenadian Revolution took place. Should it be based on the Russian model, which was the version of the view of Bernard Cord, or should they set up workers' councils, arm the people, and distribute the land in mass, as well as others, other measures? Well, they had a giant internal battle. And it included Bernard Cord arresting the prime minister of the country, Maurice Bishop, who was personal friends with Fidel Castro and had visited Cuba. The Cubans provided 13 fishing boats to the Grenadians before, and refrigerator facilities. Before that, 5,000 Grenadian, basically rowboats, had to go out to sea every day. Many people were lost and they had to try to preserve the fish they caught on tin roofs because they had no refrigeration facilities. The Cubans solved that problem and were highly respected. Maurice Bishop and his friends were locked up in their own houses when a demonstration of some 80,000 people, there were only 100,000 in the entire nation, mobilized in Grenada in 1981 or so and freed Maurice, who marched on the military barracks to arrest Bernard Cord. The response was the Cord leadership open fired, murdered Maurice Bishop, 
and his companion Jackie Kreft and seven other central leaders of the Grenadian Revolution. The left didn't know what to say in the United States. The Communist Party backed Bernard Cord. He was the democratically chosen leader of the New Jewel Movement and basically the head of state. Maurice Bishop had been reduced to a titular status. At that point, I was on the National Committee of the Socialist Workers Party, and we called the demonstration in San Francisco, which was to keep the United States off of Grenada. The United States sent a fleet to invade. At that point, the leadership of the party, and I was an oppositionist inside the party, said to me, uh, Jeff, what are you going to do with this demonstration? We had 5,000 people at the uh, Civic Center in, uh, in, uh, in San Francisco uh, to protest the coming US invasion. And I said, we're gonna say US out now, hands off Grenada. And what are you going to say about Maurice Bishop? Uh, and I said, I'm gonna oppose <clears throat> his assassination by Bernard Cord." And they said, but Bishop, was a minority in the New Jewel movement. He's a minority in his own party. My response was, well, I'm a minority in my party. Are you gonna shoot me? Needless to say, those are the remarks I made. I resigned from a party that I had been a leader of for 20 years, and the left couldn't figure out what to say about the events in Grenada until Fidel, Fidel Castro issued a statement declaring that Bernard Cord was a Stalinist dog, that he had usurped power, that he that the Cubans would have nothing to do with the uh, coup that he organized, not to mention the murder of Maurice Bishop. Fidel once again stuck to his principles. And that was the basic position of the Cubans from the, from the beginning. They stuck to principles which were based not so much on Marxist formulas, but based on the best way to advance the needs of the Cuban people. They pioneered not only a literacy campaign, but they pioneered a massive land reform, the nationalization of the wealth of the country, the arming of the people, the establishment of committees for the defense of the revolution that guaranteed distribution of medical supplies, and the active participation of the Cuban people. The Cubans rejected the idea that poor countries or so-called backward countries had to go through a quote, two-stage revolution. The first stage to establish bourgeois democracy in alliance with the anti-reactionary um, forces uh, to win elections and then at some future unspecified time to challenge capitalist property. That was not Fidel's um, orientation. Fidel initiated the most critical exchanges with the Cuban people that any head of state has ever done except for the Russian revolution. But the difference was that Fidel had access to modern technology, radio, and television. Lenin and Trotsky in their discussions as co-leaders of the Russian Revolution rarely spoke to crowds of more than a couple of hundred or thousands of people. Fidel spoke to millions as he did in 1970 to report on the abject failure of Cuba's campaign to harvest 10 million tons of sugar. He spoke before the people and said it was a terrible mistake we set back the Cuban economy. We focused so much on cutting cane that we ignored all of the other aspects of building a rounded economy. We tried to do it by example, by volunteer labor, by using modern technology, and we failed. Not only did we fail in only harvesting eight and a half million tons of sugar, but all of the other aspects of economic life were severely uh, compromised by that campaign. The Cuban leader stood before the Cuban people and apologized, took personal responsibility for the failure of the campaign, explained in detail how it distorted the economy, and honestly 
explained that it was the responsibility of the leadership of the Cuban revolution. Fidel was greeted with tremendous warmth. He earned his spurs by organizing the most impressive socialist revolution since the 1917 Russian revolution. Fidel was a leader who was integrated into the lives of the people. I remember when the boat incident took place, the Marialistas were leaving Cuba and were destroying property in the poorest sections of Cuba's downtown. Fidel met with the Communist Party at that point and said, they had a discussion and people said, well, we have to send the army. They're breaking windows, destroying property, looting and taking ferry boats uh, to leave the country. Fidel said once again, if we have to use the army against the Cuban people, we've lost the revolution. And he went himself with one driver, no weapons, in a Jeep to downtown Havana, stood up in the Jeep and addressed tens of thousands of people and urged them to go home. There was no army protecting him, but he was successful. Thousands of people returned to their home. They had respect for the Cuban revolution. While Cuba doesn't have formal institutions of workers' democracy, as the Russian Revolution Soviets were, it has many other institutions which directly involve the Cuban people. The most important initially was the fact that the Cuban people were armed and they took their weapons home. They didn't bring them to some barracks or storage place. They had the power to do what they pleased. The committees for the defense of the revolution were mass undertakings where the majority of the Cuban population discussed and debated Cuban policy. Anytime a major decision is made in Cuba, it is not handed down, but a proposal is sent for discussions across the country where literally millions of people participate in debates on changes in the constitution, on economic policy, on land reform, and a myriad of other questions which directly affect the lives of the people. The Cuban people believe that the revolution is their own. And what context does this take place in? It takes place, takes place in the context of the most vicious, mean, embargo, blockade, sanctions, assassination attempts in the history of the world for 60 years. Cuba has been beleaguered by imperialism. Any ship from anywhere in the world that stops in Cuban ports can no longer land anywhere in the world according to the provisions of United States law. The current Biden administration has continued Trump's worsening of the embargo and blockade. The simplest products are banned from being in Cuba. Medicines, medical supplies, tools, replacement equipment. The Cubans had to build an economy which today, as beleaguered as it is, it is encompasses the best wishes and aspirations of the Cuban people possible. They rationed food and other goods because if they didn't, people would starve. They carefully cut down on corruption because the basic institutions of Cuban society, including the committees for the defense of the revolution, are aimed at weeding out those inevitable instances where a handful of people use their authority to the disadvantage of many. The Soviet Union basically thought that the Cubans made a mistake in making their revolution. It was not their view. They had the two-stage theory, wherein the Stalinists who ruled that country basically argued that everywhere in Latin America, if not Africa and poor countries, had to, because of their backwardness, form alliances with the national bourgeoisie. We saw that in Nicaragua when the Sandinistas in 1979 chose to not take the Cuban road. We see it today tragically in Venezuela where a popular government 
headed by Nicolas Maduro and before that by uh, Hugo Chavez, basically mobilized millions and were elected to the presidency and then had to decide how to proceed. To this day, the Venezuelans have not distributed the land. The major banking and capitalist institutions still control the vast wealth of the country, including the oil resources of that country, while the Nicaraguans, while, while the Venezuelans have control of the uh, petroleum producing factories, United States interests still have significant shares of Venezuela's oil, as do other foreign interests. You can't make a serious revolution without giving the land to the peasants without challenging bourgeois property. That's the major failing of the Venezuelans. That's what caused the debate that ended the Nicaraguan revolution. And in El Salvador, we had the same debates where the FMLN, the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front, decided that they would not take the Cuban road. The history of El Salvador is another sad example of the role of Stalinist parties in that country. If you'd like, I can go into it in more detail. So with that, I want to say that the Cuban revolution was my revolution. It won me to the socialist movement. It won generations of young people because it demonstrated that a poor beleaguered people could control their own country determine their future, advance their education and culture. We invited Cubans to come to the United States at the 1991 Dialogue with Cuba conference and 30 of them attended. They shocked the audience of 2000 people. They visited every university and college within 90 miles of the Berkeley campus. They had a truth to tell about Cuba's AIDS program which was the finest in the world, about Cuba's literacy program, about Cuba's economic program, about Cuba's culture, about Cuba's athletic programs. And they absolutely stunned thousands of people who understood that they were dealing with a real revolution. The Cubans inspired me as a young person. At the time, a youngster in our party, who we later ran for president, who some of you knew, Peter Camayo visited Cuba and toured the country on behalf of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee and explained to young people everywhere the kinds of things that I'm telling you today. He won a whole generation of young people to revolutionary socialist politics. The Cuban revolution was our revolution. Fidel and Che were our comrades, even though they made mistakes. Yes, we had many criticisms of Che, who was a moral example to revolutionaries everywhere, but had the flawed idea that tiny isolated guerrilla groups could bring workers to power and challenge capitalist rule. That revolution of Cuba cannot be repeated in my view. The future revolutions will not start with isolated, however dedicated revolutionaries in the countryside marching on the cities and instituting social reforms. What's needed everywhere in the world, including in Cuba, is the construction of deeply rooted revolutionary socialist parties aimed at the abolition of capitalist rule and the organization of the vast majority to do that. In the United States, we have the same problem. We have major divisions on the left. Should we build independent working class parties labor parties, mass revolutionary socialist parties, or is the way forward in the United States to pick the lesser evil of the Democrats, whatever Democrat there is, whether it's Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton or Joseph Biden or Barack Obama, all of them are committed to the capitalist system. Breaking with that system in every country in the world, building an international of revolutionaries dedicated to collaboration like the Cubans were is the future. So I'll leave it at that.
Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, very stimulating uh, presentation. Um, we're going to take a break, a short break be between the be uh, between your presentation and the question and answer for a few announcements. Uh, Jean, would you like to go uh, speak about our future programs? Uh, I can, but uh, I think maybe Alan has that uh, is prepared better prepared than I am. I thought okay. I would just kick back today. And okay, Alan. Alan. Okay, can... I'll be I'll be right with you. <laughs> okay, hold on. And I, well, in the meantime, while you're getting ready, let me just uh, remind people. Um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, our request for um, funds. Uh, we make a, we, we have some need for funds for our own purposes and for the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, which we're still regard as our spiritual homes. Uh, I posted on the uh, chat some information about how you can tr contribute either through PayPal or checks or Patreon. Um, so please, please review that and uh, give generously. Uh, I want to also suggest that um, some of our programs that we've had result in suggestions and input from um, audience members. And I, I, you know, I hope um, members, I want to invite me uh, members of our audience to um, to, to think about participating as presenters or suggestions for presenters in this, or suggestions for activities for ICSS. Um, you know, we're not a closed organization. We want to be, we, we, we are open to uh, participation from all, all um, um, Marxist trends. Um, also remind you that um, our, um, um, our programs are, are recorded on YouTube and you can find information on previous programs and upcoming programs on our website, icssmarks.org. So and it's in the chat, uh, the first entry on the chat and you can find that link there. Okay, I'll turn it over to Alan who will give us a rundown on future programs. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, just want to call your attention to next week, we have a speaker, Dave McKee, who is the editor of People's Voice, um, a leading Canadian uh, socialist newspaper. He will be speaking on working class environmentalism. That's next week, October 3rd at 1030 Pacific time. Uh, on October 24th, we will have uh, Stephen Gallens, who's spoken at the library before, who will be speaking about COVID. He's writing a new book, The Killer's Henchman, Capitalism and the COVID Disaster. So talking a little bit about how the pandemic has been handled in different countries, what are some of the questions that uh, uh, countries have had to confront in the different ways that they've uh, solved the uh, pandemic or dealt with the pandemic issue, not solved it, but dealt with it. Um, on the, the uh, I believe it's October, last, last Sunday in October, uh, Raj, do you wanna go ahead and um, uh, announce uh, the program then? Uh, last Sunday of the October, yeah, uh, Charlotte Lane will be speaking. I do not have a write-up on that, but he's going to talk about cooperation, the various forms of cooperation as an alternate to capitalist mode of production. Okay. Okay. Is that, is that it, Alan? Yeah, that's okay. it. Okay, so we're going to open, open the floor for uh, questions and comments. You can, uh, you can uh, um, participate by raising your hand through the chat, through, yeah, Lawrence, I see you. But please um, go, go to the button at the bottom of your screen said reactions, press that and there's a raise your hand thing uh, um, 
button on that screen. So for now, uh, the first person is Raj, and I'll I'll recognize Lawrence afterwards, and then the next next people after the next hands I see will be that. Go ahead, Raj. So Jeff, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Very informative, tracked the history, and gave us a lot of details. And I'm very happy that you're a very strong supporter of Cuban Revolution, as I am too. I haven't gone there, but I'm a supporter of Cuban Revolution and Cuban system actually with all its deficiencies that it may have. But uh, I want to uh, make uh, some comments and you can react to that, is I think you're misrepresenting certain things, not necessarily about Fidel. First of all, you've set Fidel against Stalin, which I find interesting. Uh, so in fact, what is common between Stalin and Fidel is that the peasant were part of strategic alliance in both cases, which you support, which I'm glad to see a follower of Trotsky supports now, because Trotsky wasn't that. In fact, his whole thing was against it. And he was isolated because of that. As you know, in 1926, he was defeated, his alternate program, which he backed with uh, Zinoviev. So uh, the second thing I want to say, there's no such thing as Stalinist. People who believe Stalin was a legitimate leader call themselves Leninist. It's Trotskyists who call them, they want to separate Lenin from Stalin. In fact, the separation is between, in my opinion, Lenin with Trotsky, ideologically. Now, Trotsky was a great leader, there's no question about it, uh, but the ideas were different. And that's where the falling out starts. So the other thing is the two states of revolution is also not either Lenin or Stalin. This is actually a Menshevik thesis. So I don't know why the, and you're not alone, but a lot of people actually from Trotsky, uh, following of Trotsky, continue to believe somehow that this two-stage revolution is part of Stalin's uh, strategy. No, they, it is, there's no evidence of that. And uh, uh, if there is, you can, Tell me about that. But thirdly, the uh, the word revolution the, that Trotsky himself said, you know, the permanent revolution. I see that process unfolding already after the Soviet revolution in China, then on to several countries in Asia, and far up to up to uh, Cuba. But that way uh, actually uh, did not last. That's true, and that's. Correct, I think the 20th century socialism collapsed. But anyway, your focus is on Cuba. I don't want to take too far away, but I'm very glad that you recognize the peasants as a thing which was part of Lenin's uh, very fundamental thesis of Bolshevism is that uh, the three legs of Bolshevism, as I understand, is uh, anti-capitalism, uh, uh, working with the peasants, you know, the poor peasants, middle peasants, as well as uh, uh, oppressed nationalities. That is what Bolshevism is. And I don't think Stalin varied from that. But anyway, you're focused on Cuba and I do appreciate what you gave us on Cuba, except setting okay, Fidel okay. against Stalin. Thank you. Uh, would you like to respond, uh, Jeff? Or is it? Um, I will happily respond, but let's hear from some other folks. And then okay, I and, and, and I'd like to ask people to to keep their questions brief and you know single question, sing, at least for the first round. Um, next is Lawrence, followed by Laura Wells and Mala. Lawrence, Lawrence Shoup. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Jeff, for really an excellent presentation, and accurate. It's pretty hard to do justice to. Uh, the stories that you were doing, you did a great job within the time you had. Uh, but I think there were a couple things that uh, I think should be stressed to the, also mentioned at least to the audience, and that is the Cuban healthcare system is kind of unique and created by the Cuban doctors. Uh, that's the family doctor system within the neighborhoods backed up by the larger hospitals, et cetera, where they, where they can't do things in the neighborhood. But that, that's a unique system in the world, I think. I don't know any other place in the world 
that does that. And it's really a wonderful system. And I think it should be mentioned. And I, I don't think I didn't hear you mention it. Another thing is uh, Cuba and Africa. And of course, uh, that was not uh, the Cuban army sent to Africa. That was Fidel going around the island and asking people if they wanted to support the Angolans in 1975, fighting against the South African invasion. And the Cuban people said, yes, we do. Uh, and so we volunteer. And they sent all volunteers to stop the South African takeover of Angola, which is a wonderful thing in the history of the world, I think. Uh, I was in the Peace Corps in Africa in the 60s. And when the Cubans went into Africa to stop the racist apartheid regime trying to oppress the Angolans, I thought that was just a wonderful thing. And it was Cuba that did that, uh, not some other country. And they lost thousands of their people, men and women, who uh, volunteered to go and fight the South Africans in, in Africa. Anyway, there's a couple of things there that I think you might want to mention a little bit more on. I, I outlined it a little bit, but maybe you want to add something. Anyway, I appreciated your talk very much, Jeff. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Uh, if Jeff, uh, next one is Laura Wells, followed Hi. by, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I, again, I, I thought it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to put in the chat uh, something about stopping the Renaissance Act that is going through Washington now, which would be ramping up sanctions against Nicaragua. As I'm sure everybody here knows, the Troika of Tyranny, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua all have sanctions, illegal sanctions against them placed by the U.S. Um, and there, and Biden is, of course, ramping up Trumps rather than uh, bring, eliminating them completely. So I'll put that in the chat. But my question is about, um, I know that Fidel and Hugo Chavez had sort of a father-son relationship and that uh, they, that Hugo Chavez is el mejor amigo Hugo Chavez was, you know, in the one of the things that you could see uh, in Cuba in public places, and so I'm curious about more about that. You know, that Fidel. Uh, my understanding is that he counseled, as you mentioned, that he that he had said to Ortega in 1979 in Nicaragua. Uh, my understanding is that he said to Hugo Chavez about Venezuela that they would not, that the Cuba way of revolution, um, he was not counseling that people would do that in these decades. So just a little bit more about that would be um, appreciated. Thank you. Jeff, would you like to uh, answer that question? Well, let's hear a couple more questions. I really appreciate them all. And I think, uh, okay, and okay. Mala and then Jean and Yusuf. Gene Rule. Mala, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. I did, yes. I, I also want to thank you. It was a wonderful presentation, very interesting. I uh, didn't know as an old CP member, I was going to be listening to somebody from the SWP or whatever organizations you were involved in, but I appreciated your presentation. Um, I'm a little confused about a few things. Other people have brought this up and that was Fidel's close relationships and counseling to Hugo Chavez and also Salvador Allende. And I distinctly remember when I was in Cuba, Fidel telling advising Allende to arm the people. And, um, but I think the gist of all this is that whether all these other quote unquote failed revolutions were able to follow the Cuban model or not, they never took state power and they were at the risk of 
of what happened to all of them. Um, they never took state power the way the Cubans did. Maybe, maybe you could clarify that. Um, I'm also a little confused. I was working at Radio Havana and we were reporting on the murder of Bishop. And I, I remember probably uh, incorrectly that it was US troops that came into Grenada and killed Bishop, not Corridor. I don't even remember this other guy. Um, by the way, my son is named Maurice after Maurice Bishop. Um, the other thing is you laid great emphasis on uh, l the land distribution. Um, land was not originally, uh, I mean, it was nationalized, but it was not directly distributed to peasants. It was turned into collective farms. And the Cubans have since then decided it was a terrible mistake. And now they are that they broke them up and they're distributing uh, the land to small uh, farmers. And I think that one of the terrible failures of the Cuban revolution has been and continues to be food self-sufficiency. I'm, I'm well aware that many countries in the Caribbean, England, whatever, import a lot of their food, but Cuba is terribly, terribly suffering from, um, from a food problem. Uh, some of it has to do with lack of trucks for distribution. I've been told over and over again that the food is farmed and sits there rotting, waiting for it to be picked up and distributed. There's also been a lot of problems with pay scale for farmers who have in effect sabotaged farming to a certain extent. They're sick and tired of the low returns for their work. Anyway, I'd like you to comment on, on, on the food problem in Cuba as well, how you see it. Thank you. Sorry if I took up too much time. Okay. Um, the next person is Jean Rule. Wait, uh, Jeff, uh, unmute yourself if you're you want to comment. Yeah, uh, there's a number of questions. If I could, then we can continue with the questioning. I'd like to comment. Is that okay? Well, I think I think it would be helpful if you could comment at least in the middle at this point, because it, I think people lose the thread of the conversation. <clears throat> okay. First, uh, as I said, I'm honored to be here. And I appreciate the fact that this uh, Marxist library, Neville Proctor, organizes events with a broad range of speakers who are dedicated to revolutionary socialism. So with that, let me answer all of the questions uh, as briefly as I can. Raj raised all the traditional points uh, given the Stalin-Trotsky dispute. I have to honestly say that I disagree with him entirely. There was a debate in the Russian Revolution as to what the nature of that revolution would be. One group said, we can't make a revolution in backward Russia that is socialist because the country is backward and poor. 90% of the population are peasants. Huge amounts of uh, people are literate. We have to form a democratic alliance of the workers and peasants. That was Lenin's original formula. After the 1905 revolution, it became clear to the Bolshevik party, which was part of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, that the expected support of the anti-Tsarist bourgeoisie was not there. When the workers rose up in 1905 to challenge Tsarist rule, the bourgeoisie essentially supported the Tsar. They were afraid of the working class. In 1917, Lenin and Trotsky were in exile. And when they returned, they basically formed the bloc. And the bloc was 
on the basis that the nature of the Russian Revolution had to be socialist. I remember Lenin arriving in the Finland station, which was uh, in St. Petersburg, and uh, they put a bouquet in his hand and they said, speak, and all the other tendencies, because in, in February when Lenin arrived, uh, the czar had been overthrown in the February revolution. He arrived in April or so, and Trotsky shortly after. So they, they all went down, the Mensheviks, the Bolsheviks, the anarchists, the bourgeois government, the Kerensky force, they all went back to see what exile Lenin would have to say. And he argued that all power should be in the Soviets, not the coalition government of Kerensky, not the provisional government, but a working class government led by the Soviets in the vast majority working class organizations in alliance with the peasants. But the peasants were to be won to the revolution by giving them the land, but the Bolsheviks never expected the peasants to play a leading role in that revolution. They gave them the land and that cemented their relation to the Bolsheviks, but it was the working class Bolsheviks that established the socialist society, nationalized bourgeois property, electrified the country, organized alliances around the world, set up a new international. That was the theory of permanent revolution. And that is the revolution can't stop at a bourgeois stage, can't, can't rely on a provisional bourgeois government headed by Kerensky, can't rely on the bourgeoisie to give the land to the peasants. Well, that's basically what Trotskyism is. Lenin formed the bloc with Trotsky against Stalin in the, in, uh, uh, after, uh, in the last years of his life. So the relevance of the Cuban revolution to these debates is absolutely important. And uh, I don't think it behooves us at this point to go into the details. People can read that for themselves. Larry Shoup made a perfect point. The Cubans model of healthcare was exemplary. They set up healthcare stations with trained people across the country. When most countries uh, in Latin America have their major cities populated with the poorest people on the outskirts of the city, Havana basically maintained a stable population from the revolution to 25 years later because it brought culture, literacy, healthcare, education to the countryside. It set up universities across the country. It set up healthcare stations. It modernized technology. It supported the peasants. So Larry is 100% right on the, um, on the nature of the Cuban healthcare system. Also, the point that Larry made was exemplary. Here you have a tiny country, revolutionary Cuba, sending black people in Cuba and the Cubans ended discrimination. They did an amazing number of things. Uh, and uh, because the, the legacy of slavery still existed under the Batista regime. The Cubans banned every form of discrimination and integrated blacks into every aspect of public life. But they also sent troops to Angola to fight the South African troops uh, that had invaded to try to destroy the Angolan government. The Cubans had differences with the Neto government in, um, in Angola, but they supported their right to self-determination and their defeat of South Africa basically opened the door to the ending of apartheid in South Africa itself, not to mention in the neighboring Namibia. The Cubans example was exemplary everywhere. And it shocked the world. The United States didn't know what to do. Here you have literally tens of thousands of Cuban soldiers supporting a national liberation movement, fighting the US apartheid ally. That was exemplary to say the least. As far as um, Marla, you're right that the Cubans took state power, but the Nicaraguans and even Salvador Allende, who you mentioned, 
Allende won an election in the country and he had to decide what to do. And Fidel visited him and he gave him Allende a present, which is a gun. He said, you're going to be challenged by the bourgeois regime. Allende didn't take the Cuban course. He didn't nationalize the uh, Chilean uh, tin mines and other major resources in the country. And in fact, he was a minority in a bourgeois parliament. Even though the Chilean masses were beginning to organize and set up popular councils across the country, Allende didn't support them. And the result was when the US backed the Pinochet coup that slaughtered 60,000 people and destroyed the, any opportunity to move forward, the Cubans basically predicted it. It said, you can't make a revolution that doesn't solve the needs of the Chilean masses. You have to give the massive peasants the land and the working class control of their own lives and the factories. So the Chilean example was yet another example of what happens when the revolution doesn't proceed to abolishing uh, capitalism and state power. On Marla's question, Bernard Cord organized his uh, General Hudson Austin army to march on, uh, to open fire and murder Maurice Bishop. My comrades and friends were there. They were at a military base. I forgot the name of it. They had to jump off cliffs in order to escape Cord's murderers. Cord murdered George Lewison, who was the Minister of Agriculture, Jackie Kraft, who was the Minister of Education, and Maurice Bishop on the spot. And that opened the door for the United States to say, well, the country's in chaos. And they sent the Marines from Jamaica. When they sent the Marines to Jamaica, the United States said, well, we don't want to, uh, by the way, the, the, the Cubans were working in Grenada to build an airport. Grenada was the poorest country in the Caribbean. It was nicknamed the armpit of the Caribbean. It had no airport. It had a tiny Piper Cub type airport at Point Saline. The Cubans with the Grenadians uh, working together, Cuban workers built a world-class airport in Cuba that could land jet planes and bring new tourist industries and others to Grenada. The Cuban, the Cuban army was present with the United States invaded and the American administration promised that if the Cubans don't fire, you know, we won't, but the Cubans attacked, I mean, the American army attacked the Cubans and they were the only ones in the country that defended Grenada and they were arrested in mass. So yes, the United States invaded Grenada <clears throat> but after the, the uh, Maurice Bishop and the leadership of that revolution were murdered. On the land and food, you have to understand that the very soul of your conscience, what it's like to organize a revolutionary society in the face of a worldwide embargo and blockade for 60 years. That's an act of war by the United States government against the poor beleaguered people, an island of 11 million people, has no access to food. The miracle is that Cuba survived, that it diversified its agriculture, that it made parts to repair its machinery. You're right, there are no trucks. You're right, there's discontent in the countryside. Cuba's land reform, the INRA, may, went through a whole number of permutations and combinations. They started out with the base. They convinced the peasants that it was their revolution, which they had fought for, and they gave them the land, and they gave them tools, and they built roads, and they electrified the countryside. They built universities and healthcare system. So the countryside was no longer isolated and separate from the major city, uh, Havana, and other major centers. In time, they began to experiment. They said, you know, I mean, the typical peasant would say, you know, this is a, I have a piece of land and I'm tilling it with primitive methods and ox and so on, but it's my land. The Cubans said, you don't have to be a poor peasant with an ox and your fenced in land. If you combine it with others, we can give you tractors 
we can maintain the tractors, we can build roads, we can provide a better life than you have experienced, where you have the freedom not only to eat food for education and culture, but you have the freedom to fully develop yourself as opposed to what Lenin and others called the idiocy of rural life, isolated from major cities, from culture, you know, dominated by religious uh, ideas and forced to sweat and toil on a small piece of land. So the Cubans began to modernize agriculture by example, not, be, not by forcing people uh, onto the land or off the land or to form collectives or cooperatives and so on. And they did it patiently in various forms to do it in accord with the needs of the Cuban people. So yes, I'm for land reform, but land reform in a poor country like Cuba started with giving a poor peasant a small piece of land, having a young person work with him in the literacy campaign. That was, by the way, the Cubans adopted the Paulo Freire method of education. And that is a liberated people can fundamentally change the world if the land is theirs, if they have an education. That is lit, uh, lit, teaching literacy was combined with the social measures that liberated the mind and bodies of the Cuban people. So um, on food and pay scales, you're right. Cuba has not been able as a small, isolated, beleaguered island to solve all of its problems. It organizes rationing because there's not enough food for everybody, but they guarantee food for everyone, milk for children, childcare. To this day, childcare is free in Cuba. Education is free from the cradle to the grave. Healthcare is free to everyone. But free or not, if you don't have the medical supplies, if you don't have the equipment, the inoculation, I mean, uh, wonderful Americans sent 5 million syringes in Cuba to inoculate the population. But here you have poverty stricken Cuba imposed poverty, developing one of the vaccines that it took the world's most advanced cultures and scientists to develop. And they gave that to as many people as they could. So yes, in July, I think it was July 11th, there were thousands of people in some cities protesting. They protested because they were hungry, because there was an increase in COVID-19. Although Cubans took measures to keep the COVID-19 down to rates that were the lowest in all of Latin America, because they had free medical care, because they quarantined people, because they, they mandated masks, because they had a world-class health system. So the death rate in Cuba was among the lowest in the world. The Cubans have tried with unbelievable equipment to overcome the power of a combination of the world's greatest powers. Not only have they overcome evasion interventions, the United States organized some 37 assassin att assassination attempts on the Fidel, Fidel uh, leadership. The Cubans are a miraculous people. And when you sit and talk to them, they are very real. I mean, here I was a relative stranger with a friend walking over to Cuba and I stopped by the uh, a building that has the Central Committee of the Communist Party. And I went over to the guard and, I, and he said, what can I do for you? And I said, I'm Jeff Mackler. I'm the National Secretary of Social Action. I'd like to speak to the leadership of the Cuban Revolution. And he said, just a minute. And he called up. And the guard sent me into this building where I went to a counter, sat down for a half hour. I was with, at the time, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture was there getting cancer treatment. And the Cubans asked if I wanted to tour the country with Stokely or Kwame Ture. But within an hour, I was sitting down and talking to Georgina Herina Shabao and Felix uh, Hernandez, who were the heads of the uh, North American section of the uh, relations of North America. And they organized a total stranger, me to visit Cuban farms, Cuban agriculture, Cuban scientists, Cuban space program, Cuban health programs, Cuban trade unions, Cuban military, Cuban cadre school, anywhere I wanted to go, I could go. 
I want to tell a little story. At the end of the trip, since I was treated extremely well, by the way, they had a file on me as they have a file on every revolutionary and radical group in the United States. They know who we are because you're measured in Cuba by your deeds and we were supporters of the Cuban revolution. At the end of the trip, I said to the Cubans, you know, I've been treated wonderfully. Uh, so I'd like to take Georgina and Felix and your family out for dinner. And uh, let's go to a nice restaurant. We've been having ham sandwiches. So they were embarrassed, but they said, okay. And we went to a nice restaurant, which had tablecloths. And at the end, the, the waiter comes over and he hands me a bill and it was a hundred dollars. Well, I had been used to paying five bucks or six dollars, seven dollars. If you went to a Polydor, one of these private places, you'd get a meal for seven dollars. I didn't have a hundred dollars in cash. So I said to the Cubans, this is leaders of the Cuban revolution. Uh, you just stay here, please. And I'll go back to the hotel and it's safe and I'll get the hundred dollars cash and I'll pay. And the Cuban waiter said, no, 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 don't worry. You know, uh, $80 is plenty. I said, no, no. And a jerk that I was, I'll pay, I'll pay. At which point Felix Rodriguez says, just a second. And he opens up his wallet. And in the deepest recesses of his wallet, he pulls out a piece of paper that's the size of a postage stamp. And he unrolls it and unrolls it and unravels it and unravels it. And finally, it turned out to be a $20 bill. And the first thing he said to me was, Jeff, it's not mine. My daughter works in the tourist industry. I, she got it as a tip. She asked me to hold it. And just think of that. Here is a central leader responsible for relations with North American affairs, embarrassed that he had a $20 bill. This bureaucrat who lived like the people, who was a basketball player like Fidel was, this bureaucrat was embarrassed to have a $20 bill and disclaimed that he even owned it. it. Gives you an idea of the attitude of the Cuban leadership towards bureaucracy. It was Fidel Castro who early on, seeing that the old communist party that didn't support the revolution and was head by, headed by a man named Anibal Escalante, who began appointing his CP people, mostly of Stalinist origins, to various posts. And they hadn't won that authority from the Cuban people. And Fidel basically organized a purge of all of Escalante's people, including Escalante. He wrote pamphlets called The Revolution Must Be a School of Unfettered Thought. He wrote about the incident of the party and in a, in a pamphlet called Against Bureaucracy and Sectarianism. He was a model and the Cubans at every level emulated that. Anyway, let's continue okay. with questions. Okay, uh, Gene, did you still wanna, wanna answer, ask a question or make a comment? You're, you're muted, Gene. No, I'm not muted, I hope. Okay, th ahead. thank you so much, Jeff. That was uh, really good. And uh, I really enjoyed your talk, uh, you know, when I used to bump into you around the, we both had meetings at the library and uh, I knew you were an active guy, but I didn't realize how active and how deeply you've been involved in the uh, struggles uh, for socialism and liberation. So again, on behalf of the Institute, I just wanna say that we are honored uh, to have you speak today and look forward to having you back again. Um, uh, uh, I, I uh, and I remember um, uh, when I was a student at Columbia back in the 1960s, I used to go downtown very frequently on Friday evenings to the militant labor forum. And I learned a lot from them and I've always had kind of a soft spot in my heart for Trotskyism, although uh, I probably would have considered myself Trotskyist in those days but those days uh, are gone. But I really respect the way you've uh, hung on to your views and uh, uh, kept them front and center. So th thank you so much for that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to comment is uh, that what Cuba has done on such small 
uh, resources. It's as tiny island, as you said, with uh, just 11 million people. Um, and what they have done is so impressive. But on the other hand, let's uh, no mention was made of uh, the world historic revolution in China and the fact that um, you know, here we have 1.4 billion people who can defend themselves with nuclear weapons and they don't have anything really to fear uh, from uh, the, the uh, imperialists. So uh, I think that needs to be, be stressed in here. And this is one of our major struggles. I'm also in Veterans for Peace and uh, we're very much involved with the struggle to against the Cold War on China. So I just wanted to make that comment. And again, uh, uh, thank you so much for your talk and your, your experiences. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Um, the next is Yusuf. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, I thank you for an interesting talk. I don't agree with everything, uh, but uh, the, in terms of Cuba, it was uh, uh, very interesting and quite good. Uh, I would take exception that you characterized um, uh, you said Stalinist, but uh, uh, I I would say uh, the Soviet Union um, uh, uh, didn't, uh, as a rule, uh, support uh, the two-stage uh, revolution. I know that uh, I'm from Turkey, uh, and I know in the 1960s, uh, when the Communist Party of Turkey was mainly based uh, in Warsaw Pact countries, um, uh, the um, it was the Communist Party of Turkey that uh, supported uh, the stage of revolution, the socialist revolution, uh, and whereas uh, those uh, inside Turkey uh, uh, said that um, it is a uh, the uh, uh, national democratic revolution, and they didn't make they they made the mistake of not distinguishing themselves clearly from left nationalists. Um, so um, was my, that's the comment part. The question part, so could you summarize uh, in so many words, just out of curiosity, uh, uh, so why you as a Trotskyist make exception to Cuba, which is um, officially, uh, quote unquote, a Stalinist country? It's run by a communist party that's re internationally recognized uh, and has been uh, uh, enjoyed uh, good relations with the uh, Soviet Union. Also, let me just add uh, parenthetically, I was in Ankara uh, uh, during the missile crisis and we sort of uh, raised some eyebrows. Um, Turkey was involved and you know, possibly uh, a target of a first strike uh so uh, so could you um, answer that question and uh, if you wish uh, respond to uh my comment okay the next is um roger harris roger are you there yeah, yeah. and your video is off also yes yeah. it is on now okay well, okay. well th Go thank ahead. you jeff um in ter terms of process i, I guess i my, my preference would be if you might consider answering questions individually because it makes it a little bit more interactive. Like I, I was, I'd be interested in hearing Yusef's question rather than just having someone pontificate. I, I know that's not your intention, but I, I think it's, it might be a more democratic form to do it that way. But let, let, let me go on to, to um, my, my questions and comments. Uh, for, first, just a very small one on um, historical thing and it's um, not, not even a political thing it, it's the incident with Fidel Castro during the special period um, there was this huge um, dissident group m marching from old Havana down the Malacone he hears about that he gets he calls his driver gets into his jeep and confronts the crowd individually um, Saul Landau's account of that has saw, has Fidel not unarmed but um, Landau specifically says Castro 
strapped on his two service revolvers. And I don't know what the historical truth is, but I kind of like the, the picture of Fidel standing up in his Jeep there with his two service revolvers uh, talking to the crowd. On a more political uh, note, I, I, would, I would say, Jeff, um, I, I understand from what you're saying that you uphold the Cuban revolution. And I assume what that means is upholding its political leadership, which is the Communist Party of Cuba. And I, I think it's, it's fair to say that the Communist Party of Cuba does not have the same summary of the uh, of, of events that you, that you do, particularly on the issues of the Nicaraguan and revol and um, Venezuelan revolution. That that the Cuban Communist Party supports those those revolutions and and their and their methodology. Um, and, and on this question of methodology, whether it's a you know a two stage or one stage um, revolution. I think both of us would agree that within the last half century, there hasn't been any major revolution that succeeded. And I, I would like you to maybe address that question, because I think that's even a more overarching question about this period where not only have these revolutions not succeeded, but existing revolutions, including the Cuban revolution, have had to retrench and um, back down. Um, and why is that? The, and the reason is because of the power of the imperialists. Um, I think that was implicit in your remarks, but I think it needs to be emphasized that the power of the imperialists are out there. And I think that is important because that is our enemy and those are the people that we must defeat. Um, and, and just let me kind of end with um, a kind of a cautionary note, Jeff. And th that is that you, you, you mentioned um, that a revolution can't succeed without serving the needs of the masses. And, and right now, the US sanctions, the illegal unilateral coercive method, measures are making revolutions fail in Nicaragua, in Venezuela, and indeed in Cuba, because it's preventing those governments and those um, political leadership from meeting the material needs, the basic material needs of their people, not because of any ideological failure, but because of the uh, balance of world-class forces that are preventing the, the, the Cubans right now are starving. And um, the, the answer for us revolutionaries is that our primary task is not to tell third world countries, how to make their own revolution is to make our own revolution and get the power of the, the, the boot of the imperialists off the necks of those people. So I would emphasize that it is not our responsibility to tell the other revolutionary groups how to make their revolution, but our responsibility is primarily to make our own. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, we've come to the end of the first round. Oh, Jeff, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks again for your questions. I hear what Roger says, but I purposely uh, decided, if it's okay with you, to let everybody speak so I get a variety of questions and I don't just run on uh, one question at a time. But in any case, um, let me make some comments because these are very all very worthwhile. Um, I was directly involved in the Nicaraguan Revolution. Um, I organized a committee through my party, Socialist Action, the Mobilization for Peace, Jobs, and Justice, that organized demonstrations for Nicaragua of 80,000 in San Francisco. We invited the Nicaraguans and we toured them. We uh, toured Omar Cabezas, who wrote uh, Fire from the Mountains. We traveled to Nicaragua and at the same, and our basic theme was US hands off, self-determination for Nicaragua, no US intervention. That's what we built a mass demonstration for. We supported the right of the Nicaraguans to self-determination. But at the same time, I, I was, I am the national secretary of a political party. We wrote about Nicaragua in our newspaper. People wanted to know what was happening. And our paper 
had two aspects. On the number one aspect, we were number one in the country in organizing United Front mass actions to keep the United States out. On the other hand, we were severe critics of the Nicaraguan Sandinistas. When I went to Nicaragua, I met with Ortega and Jaime Wheelock, who is the Minister of Agriculture, and several other leaders. And I said to them, why don't you take the Cuban road? Why don't you give the land to the peasants? Why don't you nationalize? And Omar Cabezas, for example, who we toured in the Bay Area, threw up his hands and said, the revolution is like magic. Um, some peasants take the land automatically and we say, don't take this land and we give them another piece of land. But we did not take the Cuban road because we were fearful that the United States imperialist beast would invade. When the United States representatives met with the Sandinista leadership in, in Managua and in Venezuela, basically American imperialism said, look, you take the Cuban road, we're gonna cut you off. We're gonna send in the CIA. Privately, they say this, you dare nationalize our property and you're dead. And most revolutions take that seriously. They understand the imperialist beast is not some theoretical abstraction. It has the capacity to murder, assassinate, embargo, and cut you off, which is what they're doing to the Cubans. So I said to Tomas Borges and others, these are all guerrilla fighters. Nobody expected that they would take power. And they showed up defeating Somoza. And I argued with them. My party argued with them. We wrote books about it, saying, we have your back. We used to organize, we, we worked with Bob Hernandez and others who were Nicaraguans, because the Nicaraguans had the largest exile community in the country, in San Francisco and in Los Angeles. And we met with the Nicaraguans. And we said, this is our view, but join us in these mass mobilizations for self-determination. We had the same view with Allende. We said, if you don't challenge bourgeois property, and arm the people, the army's gonna slaughter you. And sure enough, that's what happened to Pinochet. We said the same thing to the Nicaraguans. These are life and death questions. Now you're right that these are difficult times, Roger, for revolutionaries. The Soviet Union is no more. Capitalism, capitalism has been restored. As we speak, I just finished an article on AUKUS, the Australian, UK, US agreement to, uh, to rip off the French and build nuclear powered submarines for the Australian government. My view is that China has restored capitalism. It did it earlier than Russia. My view is as a, that during the Vietnam War, China invaded Vietnam at the end of the war. They supported the Pol Pot regime. China was the first country to recognize the Pinochet dictatorship because that was in the middle of the Sino-Soviet dispute and the Chinese argument at that time in the 70s and the late 60s, what does the greater problem was Russians. So Che and others went to uh, the Soviet Union and China and they were asked to take sides and they said, we're neutral, we're staying out of that. But they had criticisms of both of these countries. With Deng Xiaoping's coming to power, in my opinion, capitalism has been restored. I just wrote an article with some amazing statistics. 1% of Cuba own, uh, excuse me, of China own 31% of the wealth of the country, as opposed to 34% of the United States. China has 1,026 billionaires, almost double the number it had last year, because these billionaires engaged in stock market manipulations, property speculations, and other stuff. Anyway, we could discuss uh, uh, at some other time the problems of China, but the basic point that you make is the Soviet Union is no more. Cuba is the only worker state left, in my opinion, and the pressure of capitalist encirclement has defeated the Vietnamese revolution. The United States murdered 4 million Vietnamese, and my party, the SWP, was among the central leaders of the movement to bring the troops home now to support the Vietnamese revolution against American imperialism. We have opposed 
US intervention in an absolutely unqualified way everywhere in the world. We are for the abolition of 1100, all 1100 military bases. We are for bringing the troops home now. We are for the right of all poor and oppressed people of self-determination, even if we don't agree with that country. We don't agree with the Assad leadership in Syria, but we defend their right to exist and oppose US intervention in that country. The US imperialists were responsible for the murder of the death of 500,000 Syrians. And we helped lead through the United National Anti-War Coalition, United Front mobilizations that said, hands off Syria, hands off Libya, allowing these countries the right of self-determination. Back to Cuba, we didn't make an exception to Cuba. Cuba is a revolutionary society. We don't call for political revolution to replace the Cuban Communist Party. We don't think that there is a hardened, crystallized bureaucracy in Cuba that subordinates the advance of the socialist revolution to the maintenance of a bureaucratic clique, which is the case in the Soviet Union. Cuba was our revolution. Now, uh, people mention the Cuban Communist Party. There are many debates in that party. It's not a homogeneous operation. At one point, Fidel found himself a minority in the party as they debated what road for the Cuban revolution. Should they back off? Should they have special zones for private enterprise? Should they take the Chinese road? These are the open debates. And in my opinion, at one point, Fidel was a minority in the party, but his moral and political standing in the party and with the people was such that the Cubans haven't taken the Chinese road. They haven't restored capitalism. They have no intention to do so. They're maintaining the fundamental principles that a democratic revolutionary society cannot coexist with a society that's based on capitalist exploitation, private ownership of, of everything. So the Cubans are the exception. The dynamic, there's a dynamic in the Cuban party. Let me tell you, no nation on earth would allow a revolutionary to knock on the door and visit the leadership of that country collaborate with us in building the anti-war movement, organize tours. Um, Gene mentioned that in New York, he used to visit the Militant Labor Forum. I was a member of the party at that time and I helped organize those. When Fidel visited New York City, he declined to stay in the fancy hotels. They didn't want him there. So he took a hotel room in Harlem at the St. Teresa Hotel where we organized his meetings with Malcolm X. And we brought in food for the parties that they had there. And one of our comrades, Sylvia Weinstein, a beautiful blonde young woman, she's passed away now, was you know, brought in food and the New York Times and others called her Fidel's blonde prostitute. But we were very close to the Cuban revolution. The fact that Fidel stayed in Harlem and met with Malcolm was an incredible advance for the revolution, especially early on when Malcolm was improperly characterized as a racist by some. We championed Malcolm X and he championed the Cuban revolution. It was amazing. And in Harlem, Fidel was welcomed because of the role that the Cubans played in wiping out race discrimination in that country. So, um, I think I've answered most of the questions. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't know that much about the Turkish CP and the role it played. I'm glad to hear some of the information, but I, I can't comment on whether or not it was for quote, national democratic revolution or socialist revolution. I wanna say this one more thing. The debate that we had with Allende, with El Salvador, with Grenada, with Nicaragua, with Syria, with every country beleaguered by imperialists is the same. How can they defend these revolutions? The imperialists say, if you dare encroach on our capitalist property, we're gonna invade, embargo, and isolate you. That's what they're doing to Iran because they want Iran's oil. They want Venezuela's oil. That's why they picked these two countries. That's what they wanted to do with Syria where US troops sit on Syrian oil 
and ship it to Turkey for profit. In every case, the Cubans example stands out. The reason they're alive today is because they didn't stop at the quote, first stage. They, did, they didn't hesitate to give control of society to the working class and give the land to the peasants. That's the way to win the solidarity of the people. The horrible stories that we see today about hunger and poverty in Venezuela have an element of truth in them because of the United States beleaguering these countries, starving them, organizing coups. So when a country like China decides, or even Russia decides to provide food or medical supplies, we say bravo. Even though we think they're capitalist countries, we think that their aid, however minimal, to every one of these countries is proper because it's an act of solidarity with oppressed people. We don't support the Russian government or the Hezbollah. We have criticized them all. But when they send troops to challenge the US imperialist takeover of Syria, we support Syria's right to seek aid from Russia, from Iran, from Hezbollah, from the, the, the uh, Islamic militias. The right of self-determination is a critical right. Only when the imperialist beast is kept out can the people of the world decide in truth their own government, challenge their own bourgeoisie. We said U.S. out of Afghanistan and say that to this day. And we fought for 20 years to get the U.S. troops out unconditionally. But we didn't support the Taliban. We didn't support their government. But that's now for the Afghan people to decide. The construction of their own parties and mass organizations to advance their own class interests is critical. But we didn't make our support to self-determination and out now contingent on the governments that the United States was trying to overthrow. They're trying to overthrow the Iranian government, a right-wing clerical government. But they want Iran's oil. We want the bloody hands of the United States off Iran so the Iranian people can determine their own future. There are two separate questions. Self-determination is the starting point for revolutionary politics. It allows people free from imperialist control to determine their future. The Cubans set the model because they not only challenged the US-backed Batista di dictatorship, but they embarked on a social revolution that transformed Cuban society, which is the reason why it continues to exist today. Okay, thank you. Um, the next speaker is Raj. Yeah, I, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I find a couple of positions with Jeff Mackler very, very much in agreement with him. Okay, so I wanna say that I appreciate the recent answers that he's given on, on the a question that Roger raised. Uh, I agree that without uh, means of production uh, taken out from the hands of landlords and capitalists, uh, you cannot secure the revolution. That's the only base you have. I think that's a very legitimate uh, criticism of some of these countries. Now they have difficulty. I know it's a very difficult question uh, because if the United States is, has the power to invade you the next day, then the question is, are you ready for it? And that, but on the other hand, they'll kill you differently. So it's not as if you have the, any easier way out. So I, Jeff Mackler, I totally agree with him. And I think the revisionism of Khrushchev is where the unraveling began. That was the other question, why there's no revolution, why the socialist movement in such a uh, back, you know, uh, has taken such a retreat on the world stage. And part of it is, is that uh, the pressure of nuclear weapons, and but that is not, that alone cannot do it. It's really the economics, which is the Marxist analysis of society that plays a role. So uh, Khrushchev's revisionism, trying to introduce profit motive within the production thing. It wasn't the collective form that were the failure. Collective forms is what's, 
saved Soviet Union, which allowed surplus to be traded with Germany and then create industrial capacity to fight. And, and, and that the disagreement I have with Jeff is with all Trotsky is that I don't see Stalin as a bureaucrat. I see Stalin as a revolutionary. And then one of the most advanced thinkers, the greatest, one of the greatest revolutionary leaders of the 20th century. So that uh, Jeff and I disagree on that. But I agree with him, China today, capitalism is restored, is run by the, by the Communist Party. So how are you gonna have socialist revolution if you confuse what is socialism with capitalism? If you say, you know, uh, Chinese characteristics of socialism are capitalism, then you have, uh, you have completely erased the distinction. So I really appreciate Jeff's very uh, honest and straightforward uh, 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 statement on, on this. And I agree with him on those two points. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, is uh, Eugene. Rule, please. Go ahead, Gene. You can um, unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, I think I am unmuted now. Yeah, Go ahead. I, I, I just have a couple. Uh, can you hold on one second? I, I must take a break. There's someone yeah. in my door, but I'll be right back. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's wait until Jeff comes back. Okay, well, I really appreciate just to everybody else. So. Oh, he's not here. Although I disagree with a lot of points he's been making, I think they're very important points. And he has a very thoughtful and consistent uh, way of looking at things. So I just want to say, you know, um, I'll give you my quote that uh, back in the day, I would have considered myself a Trotskyist, but uh, there's a saying, I think, that he, he who is not a Trotskyist at 20 has no heart. And he who remains a Trotskyist at 40 has no head. Uh, I don't know where that quote comes from, but uh, Winston just, Churchill. Pardon? <laughs> Winston Churchill, but it was not about Trotskyism. Oh, well, sometimes I get mixed up with these things. If it, it just decided Social. to fit that in there anyway. All right. But, Jeff um, is back, I think. Jeff is back. Okay, I have two comments. The first is for those who think that capitalism has been restored in China have a very curious question is, well, does that mean that capitalism can lift 80, 800 million people out of poverty? That capitalism can solve the question of poverty? Uh, so I think that's one question they need to deal with. And the other thing uh, I just wanted to make the point is that uh, on the two-stage theory, uh, remind people it was the women of Petrograd in February, 1917, that got rid of the czar. They mobilized and the czar was chased out of town, basically had to abdicate. And when the uh, 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 Kerensky government said, well, here's, here's our plan. They looked at their program and says, well, where are the women? And the women organized a march on the Duma, occupied the Duma, uh, for the rest for I don't know how long, but basically they occupied the Duma until uh, they, the Duma agreed that uh, to, to uh, allow women to have the vote. And that's how Russia became the first country in the world that uh, um, uh, where women had the right to vote. And this was won in the February 1917 election. And remind you also that Mao said, uh, women hold up half the sky and probably more than half. So I will stop there. But again, um, thank Jeff for his, his comments and look forward to more. Richard, okay. uh, this is Raj. It's 1230. You tell okay. me wh whether the recording should be stopped or should we give a chance to uh, we normally give the speaker a chance to wrap up his presentation. Give okay. Him a few minutes to so, so, uh, uh, so Jeff, please go ahead, make your summary statement at the end, and then we'll stop recording. And then we'll have informal discussion for until one o'clock. Okay. Uh, once again, thanks for the comradely discussion, uh, debate, exchange of views and ideas. Uh, you all raise good questions, and to the extent 
that we can continue this type of discussion and learn from each other, the entire revolutionary movement will advance. Eugene asks a critical question. And I, by the way, I agree that China is capitalist and is restored capitalism. I'm writing a major piece on it. I'd be glad to send it to you. How did China do this? Well, the first thing is that in 2000, and one, the Chinese convinced that the United States that they were a safe investment and the US pioneered bringing China into the World Trade Organization. They did so because China provided an incredible amount of the cheapest labor force in the world. US factories were state of the art sent to China, where the Chinese employed in the initial period, teenage girls from the countryside in dormitory factories paying six cents an hour, as opposed to union wages in the United States where they made the same products. China became the workhouse, the cheap labor force for the world capitalist imperialist system. Over the course of 20 years, the Chinese learned from the experience consciously, and they began to use the technology to make their own factories and eventually compete with imperialism. China developed a quote, middle class, which is 400 million people, but 1 billion people still live in relatively poor uh, circumstances. If they're in the cities, they're peripheral, marginal, working in giant factories, most of them privately owned or owned by US imperialism. So China has far from eliminated poverty and hunger. China does not have free medical care or free health care or free education in that country. Those were previous gains of the Chinese revolution of 1949-53. China abandoned those. It used the intensification of workers, of labor, of working people to accumulate capital, to begin to industrialize their country where today China is the largest producer of industrial products in the world. China worked directly with US imperialism, as I said, in Vietnam. What a tragedy to have after the Vietnamese defeated American imperialism, the Chinese invaded Vietnam, only to be driven out by the Vietnamese people. And the same thing with China's relationship with other countries. So China is by far from a worker's paradise. It has gleaming cities. It has unprecedented number of billionaires. It has a stock market. It has a privileged bureaucracy. And as one of the speakers said, it has a communist party of China that presides over a capitalist state. But the question is, is this capitalist state therefore superior to what previously existed? That's a debatable question. But you have to understand that prior to the decision to restore capitalism, the world system beleaguered, invaded, attacked China from A to Z in order to maintain its underdevelopment. It was only allowed into the world capitalist system, that is the WTO, World Trade Organization, when the Chinese bureaucracy agreed to provide virtual slave labor for American corporations. That's what angered working people when their plants were shipped out of the country to China or Indonesia or Vietnam. What a terrible tragedy that Vietnamese workers labor in capitalist factories presided over by a communist party that is restorationist. Vietnam is no longer a worker state and neither, mm -hmm. is, neither is Russia or China. So it's mm -hmm. an important question. And, uh, and today it's in the front page of the headlines because the Americans now seeking, seeing China as a major competitor 
having introduced state-of-the-art factories, not the primitive Chinese factories that were existing 20 years ago, the United States and China are among the two major capitalist competitors in the world. China is the biggest investor in Latin America, is among the biggest in Latin America and, and uh, in Africa and Asia. And its investments have to do with building factories, usually with Chinese workers, which outrages, which out, uh, outrages local people. But these <laughs> factories are for profit. China built the largest number of coal-fired power plants in the world more than the whole world combined in the face of an existential crisis to humanity on fossil fuel induced global warming. So there's a lot to discuss. I'm honored to be with you. I thank Gene and Roger and the leaders and activists in the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library. It's a magnificent institution. I admire it. I intend to collaborate in the future as much as I can and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeff. And that is the, that brings us to the uh, formal end of our program today. Uh, thanks for visiting. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat, at our in-person forums. Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue. Oakland, California, 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org.